welcome the Executive Director of Heritage Action, Tim Chapman. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tim Chapman. I'm the Executive Director at Heritage Action. We're the sister organization of the Heritage Foundation. We're the political uh, sister organization, so we do a lot of advocacy work on the Hill. We have activists around the country. Um, I wanted to start with recounting a column that I read in the Wall Street Journal um, a couple weeks ago. Many of you probably read the column. It was by Peggy Noonan. And Noonan starts the column off by saying she just got off the phone with um, a longtime Republican senator. And the senator was telling her how excited he was for, um, for 2020 to come and go, because he was certain that President Trump was going to lose in 2020, and that when President Trump lost, the fever would pass and things would ratchet back to normal. And so in his mind, his mind, this was all just a temporary moment in time that we're in. Nothing really significant had changed in 2016, and that we were going to go back to the Republican Party the way that it was. That was a pretty striking column, but I can't say that it really surprised me, because being in Washington every day, I see lots of people like that who think that this is a passing moment in time, and who are yearning for the days of going back to that. But what we're working on is trying to find a way to make sure that that doesn't happen, that we capitalize on what happened in 2016. So let me describe that. So in 2016, uh, President Trump brought together a coalition that was vastly different than coalitions Republicans had enjoyed for the last decade and a half. And the biggest difference in this coalition, well, it was three parts. It was suburban Republicans, and they tend to be more moderate than we are, but they, they were part of the coalition. Then there was people like us, conservatives, grassroots Tea Partiers, folks who really believe in their bones the things that we care about, and then working class Americans. President Trump brought working class Americans into, the, into our um, coalition, and in so doing, was able to win the presidency. Just think about this for just one second. 10% of Bernie Sanders' primary voters, they, they went and cast the vote for socialist Bernie Sanders um, in the primary. They crossed the aisle and voted for President Trump in the general election. Without those 10% of voters, we lose Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, and Hillary Clinton is President of the United States. So think about this for a second. This is really important. These voters are not ideological. They are not Republicans. They are definitely not conservatives. They tend to be pretty practical, okay? So I think what we need to do as a movement is think very strategically about how to make sure we graft these voters into our movement. Teach them what it means to be Republicans. Teach them what it means to be conservatives. Teach them how our policies can make their lives better. But to do that, you really have to be strategic about this. And I think we as a movement need to be rethinking some of our policy positions in order to do it. Now, the president did this, by the way. I mean, the president did this. Why did he win that primary? Because he was the only Republican in that primary who ran, a, I'd say, on an unorthodox conservative platform. He veered from some of the kind of sacred cows of conservatism. Now, I'm not saying let's throw out our principles. We've got to fight for the things we all believe in. But there's a lesson to learn there. And the lesson to learn is that you're, he was able to draw more people into the coalition because he wasn't straitjacketed by so much. Let me kind of talk a little bit briefly about what I think this, where this could come from. A few years ago, I read a book by a guy named Danny Kruger. It's called On Fraternity. I'd recommend it to all of you. Kruger argued in this book that for most of Western politics, the fight has always been between equality and, and equality and liberty, right? That's where we, we, the left wants to claim equality, we claim liberty, and we just go after each other. He suggested that in the future, it was going to be about something that he called fraternity. Fraternity in the sense of belonging or security or community relationships, solidarity. That's the kind of language he talks about when he talks about fraternity. And he said the challenge for conservatives, and I think this is absolutely right, is if we want to be successful in the future, we need to talk about why liberty is the most natural ally of fraternity, not equality. And I believe that, and I think that's part of what the president was able to do. So, but look, here's, what here's how the left is doing it. I actually think the left is talking about this notion of fraternity. You see it 
when you look at things like the Obama era HHS cartoon that became now infamous, where it was called The Life of Julia, Kathleen Sebelius created this cartoon to show how Obama's policies were going to take care of a person cradle to grave. And in the cartoon, you see Julia being born thanks to free health care. And then you see Julia in her teenage, or you see her getting universal pre-K, and the government's f fitting the bill for that. And then you see her in her teenage years getting uh, what, whatever kind of birth control she needs free from the government. And then you see her in her retirement years and put up by the government in a retirement home. Noticeably absent in the cartoon is a mom, a dad, a family, brothers, sisters, a community, a church, anything. It's the solitary individual and the state. And that's what the left wants. And so we need to find a way to recapture some of that language. Look, at least they're talking about fraternity on the left, but they get it totally wrong. It's completely counterfeit. The other thing they offer is identity politics, right? They say, you will find your sense of meaning, you will find your sense of belonging, in your tribe, in your sexual identity, in your sexual expressiveness. And that's what they want, and that's what they're pushing. So I think the challenge for us, our knee-jerk reaction when we hear that stuff from the left is to talk about limited government, which is great, and to talk about individualism, which is great. I believe it. But radical individualism is not the response. There's something better that conservatives actually have. When you think about the traditions that we've been handed down as conservatives, it's really two pillars that we are able to rely on. One is liberty, but the other has always been order, and order in the sense of communities that work well, that, that have virtuous citizens that make it up, and that are made up of these things that Burke called little platoons of society. So that's the idea. So now, practically speaking, how do we turn this into a political agenda? What do we actually do with this? I do think Trump taught us a lot of that when he started off 2016 by kind of veering off the, some of the conservative orthodoxy. But I think we can build on it. And so the organization that I'm leading right now is dedicated to building on it. We've put a significant amount of money this year into polling all across this country. National polling, polling in these blue collar districts, polling in battleground states. Pennsylvania just got out of there with a great poll. And we're gonna do more on this, by the way, later if you wanna do, come and see our breakout session at three o'clock. But the polling is starting to show us a roadmap to these kinds of policies that can attract those people into our coalition. So just a couple things, and I'm gonna finish here. Now I'm gonna tease out a couple of the things we're finding in the polling. So first, when asked whether they're more concerned about the condition of the American economy or culture, people in our coalition overwhelmingly say culture by two thirds. And that's not just conservatives, that's working class Americans. So when we drill down on individual issues, we found a lot of examples where there's this kind of broad spectrum of people where you can build a coalition. Another thing that keeps popping up in what we're looking at is political correctness and identity politics. We have a huge opportunity on these issues with this coalition. So 90% of Republicans say that political correctness is a problem. More th three quarters of them say it's a quote, major problem. And so the numbers get just as high when you're talking about attacks on free speech. The numbers are equally as high um, no, not equally as high. The numbers are high, though, even among Democrats who say that political correctness is a major problem. This is why efforts like Josh Hawley's bill, whether you like the bill or not, and there's a very healthy debate about his bill that goes after some of these social media platforms, but whether you like the bill or not, he is over the target in trying to defend conservatives right now against what is a completely overarching um, attempt to silence them on some of these social media platforms. That kind of stuff's important. Um, so another thing that we have going for us here is that the Democrats are drifting leftward on these hot button social issues. So we're pretty even on the, on the pro-life issue right now. Uh, right now, the numbers are really within one and two percent of each other, a split across the country. But 76 percent of Americans across this country agree that, of course, a child who's born alive after a botched abortion should be provided care for. That's an easy one. This is why it's so important. We're, right now, we're working at the grassroots level to push the Born Alive Infant Protection Act, which allows us to go into moderate Democrats' districts across this country and say, why in the world would you not provide this care? Um, one other issue that I want to, to, to highlight on, um, when it comes to the LGBT issues, the way to win on this stuff is to highlight the extremism of the left. 
The, the left is so far out on this. And we, we found that more than 60% of general election voters, so that's you know, all the way across the board, um, on the issue of whether biological males should be able to play female sports, they have a thumbs down on that. That's something that's really easy to push back against, and yet the Democrats put that exact law into the Equality Act that they just passed. So in the interest of time, I'm going to cut a few of these out here, and you can come listen to them later. But I think my main message to you all today is that we don't have to sit back anymore and let the left win the culture wars. And we cer certainly don't have to cede this idea of fraternity to the left. I think that the, the conservative movement has a lot more to offer there, and we need to start thinking about how to update our policy platform to do it. Thank you. <laughs>